Welcome to Mysteries of Superstition Mountain. I'm Larry Hedrick, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today, we have another great story by Hank Sheffer. You know, when people talk about Arizona, they generally refer to the same old topics. Most of the time, they want to know, crack out of the box, something about the Grand Canyon. And then, of course, there's, there's always Jacob Walsh and his lost Dutchman gold mine which nobody's found yet, so they're good to go there. And there's the Roosevelt Dam, which is an amazing thing to see. And if you know any of the history about it, it's, that's amazing too. And of course, there are always all the cowboys and the Indians. And you can still see locations where true to life Old West Street shootouts took place, like the gunfight at OK Corral. Um, get to see where that came to a head and these guys shot at each other for 30 seconds and lots of people died. And for another, there's down in Florence, Arizona, where there was a deadly shootout that took place in the Tunnel Saloon. You know that. Wait a minute. What Tunnel Saloon? What gunfight? You don't know? You don't know about Florence? Well, let me tell you about Florence. We'll talk about that first. The Tunnel Saloon was located at 363 North uh, Main Street. And as far as the gunfight goes, it was in the year of 1888, seven years after the Tombstone Affray. Uh, and these guys got together and they had one of the last gunfights to take place in the Arizona Territory. And at that time, it was actually every bit as notorious as the OK Corral Affray. Oh, and also, just for your FYI, gunfights and shootouts in those early days, disappointing as it may be, were certainly not the ill Hollywood would have us believe. The portrait of two pistol arrows tensely facing each other in some sort of heroic, noble-like posture to pursue justice in the middle of Main Street just ain't the way it was. So now we can get on to talking about Florence, where it took place. We have some pieces here we have to put together until we get to the actual gunfighter. It won't make any sense. Well, now Florence was founded in 1866, and the Silver King claim was filed in 1875, only nine years later. And it was 30 miles away from where Florence was. Now, the key was that Florence rapidly became the boom town due to the incredible amount of silver that was taken out of the Silver King. It brought both prosperity and trouble in equal portions and was soon selected, of all things, to be the county seat of a brand new county called Pinal. So now that's what Florence is doing. Now one of our participants in this gunfight is a fellow by the name of Peter Gabriel. John Peter Gabriel was born on November 17th of 1838 in Kruft, Germany. He was just nine years old when he and his parents immigrated to the United States, and they settled in Grant County, Wisconsin. When his father died two years later, his mother found herself unable to take care of the 12-year-old, and so he was farmed out to a prominent lawyer at that time by the name of Ninian Whiteside. Now, by 1849, Whiteside had moved to Marysville on the Yuba River in California, and he was following the gold rush like so many other people had. This is where young Peter began his school of hard knocks. He had to fight his way through an early adulthood in violent, rough, and tumble mining camps of Utah County. As they said then, everybody carried guns. Everybody had a firearm and everybody was expected to solve their own problems. As they used to say, you have to kill your own snakes. Well, Ninian Whiteside, moving up in the world, became a well-known politician and judge in Marysville and Sacramento. By 1859, young Peter had crossed the Sierra Nevada on his own to work for the famed Colonel Frederick Westlander. Famous, you say, you don't know who he is. Well, I didn't know who he was either. 
but he was an explorer and a superintendent of the transcontinental wagon road. Later, Lander became a general in the Union Army during the Civil War. This is an important point because it certainly could have been one of those major differences that grew up between Peter Gabriel and his foe-to-be, Joe Five. Bear in mind, with all this happening here, uh, our fellow Peter is only 21 years old, and he's just turned 21 years old, and he's had an awful lot happen to him already. Well, by the 1860s, these were really busy years for Mr. Peter Gabriel. Through the influence of Judge Whiteside, Gabriel landed employment as a mule skinner and a hunter under Joseph D. Whitney. He was the leader of the first comprehensive geological survey of California. No, I don't know what they were doing either, but that's what he was. And the thing is, Pete stayed with that survey party for about a year, and he also served the time as a deputy sheriff. Bear in mind, this guy is really still a young fellow, but he's got a lot going for him. Well, now that May in 1864, he married Marie Reinhardt. Soon thereafter, Gabriel, wife and young daughter, moved and settled over in Prescott. Unfortunately, Peter's drinking and gambling and nasty disposition seemed to follow him everywhere he went. And I assure you, it was a nasty disposition. And it seemed to get worse with the more that he drank. Let me tell you a story, and I'll read this story to you. It says, one story goes this way, that on Christmas night in 1870, Gabriel was at a saloon in, Kir in Kirkland Valley, southwest of Prescott. He and a gambler named Boyce were drinking and playing poker. Gabriel spotted Boyce cheating and ordered him to stop. Then Gabriel, out of the clear blue sky, drew four jacks. Well, that worked. Well, that was too much, and boys now claimed Pete was cheating as well. According to one account, Boyce tried to grab the pot, and he drew a knife. Gabriel did not hesitate. He drew his six-gun and fired in an instant. One round killed Boyce instantly, while another struck into the innocent bystander sitting behind Boyce. Gabriel was charged with murder, and the case came to trial in July of 1873. It resulted in a hung jury. Everybody went home. Well, unfortunately, those weren't the only casualties of the evening. The fact that Gabriel had been drinking and gambling and shot two men on Christmas, ho, 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 did not set well with his wife. Their marriage had not been a happy one anyway, and they eventually divorced. In 1880, he would remarry a 17-year-old daughter of a friend. Oh, and that marriage didn't last any better than the first one did. I can't imagine why. Well, after that, Mr. Peter Gabriel found himself back out in California. And he was working with a fellow by the name of William R. Billy Rowland. Billy Rowland's an interesting fellow, too, if you want to go look him up. He had quite a history behind him. By now, Gabriel had achieved a reputation as a quick gun hand, and his pistols missing their trigger guard and front sight on the Colt's hardware were evidence of that. When this guy needed to have that gun in play, he got it there quickly. He is known to have had some real hard bark on him with a nasty, nasty disposition and a quick temper that escalated while drinking. I'd like to tell you a little story about his hard bark. This is a true story. That hard bark became evident during an incident in September of 1873. Notorious bandido bo boss Tiburcio Vasquez fled into northern uh, Los Angeles County following the Tres Pinos tragedy. Uh, what that, that tragedy was, that these guys rode up into this, into this ranchero and they shot three people dead as a doornail just for the sake of shooting people dead as a doornail. They weren't very nice people. Well, Sheriff Roland and the small posse approached Rancho Petrero Grande, where a band of squatters were, were huddled up. One of the squatters, Bernard Newman, opened fire. Gabriel was hit and suffered a perforated lung. 
Roland and his men hurriedly took Gabriel to Los Angeles to get doctored up. Well, the posse then returned to the rancho and arrested Newman. In the meantime, doctors in L.A. thoroughly believed that Deputy Gabriel's chances of survival were little and none. Gabriel had had other plans about this dying things, but he was laid up for months, but he, he just wouldn't die. He kept hanging in there. After a difficult recovery period, by 1875, Gabriel was well enough to return to Prescott, just in time to face the murder charge left over from back in 1873. This time, the trial was set for that October, and this time, he was acquitted of all charges completely. Well, now, after those several years of setback, Gabriel eventually drifted south to Florence, where he was running the Silver King Hotel in Pinal County. Not the one at the Silver King Mine, but the one in Florence. It was in 1877 when Sheriff Peter R. Brady, another interesting character in this whole thing, appointed him as the resident deputy. Gabriel became quite popular that year, and with, with all the locals, they, they just loved him to death, and they prompted him to run for sheriff against his own boss, um, and he did so. He did so well that he was elected, and in 1878, he won. In 1880, now this is when Sheriff Gabriel married that Carrie Rotten, the Rotten, not rotten as in rotten, but rotten as in W-R-A-T-T-E-N, the 17-year-old daughter of a friend. Hmm. Let's see, Pete is 41, and pretty little Miss Carrie is 17. What could possibly go wrong? Well, needless to say, the marriage did not survive any better than the first one had, and for essentially the same reasons. Nevertheless, Gabriel's popularity with voters won him re-election again, and he was back to doing what he did best, fighting lynch mobs and tracking down stage robbers, murderers, horse thieves, and cattle rustlers. But despite his excellent record, he lost the next election. I wonder what that was all about. Hmm, don't know. However, it's not like he was destitute or anything like that. Gabriel held mining claims in Tombstone and in the Dripping Springs Mountains above Florence near Mineral Creek Mining District. In 1883, he reportedly sold one of his interests up there for $30,000. You all can do the math and look out what wages were back then. $30,000 was a pretty good hunk of change. Just a year later, in 1884, he was elected to his last two-year term in office. This was his third term as sheriff. His grand plan was to retire at the end of that term and return to his mining activities up in the Dripping Springs Mountains. Now it's time to weave the other participant into the gunfight mix. Josephus Fye was born at Platte, Missouri on May 22nd of 1845. He, too, was without parents at an early age, and he was forced to live on a farm with his older brother, Isaac, who was a miserable human being on all counts and treated the boy very badly. Joe's only saving grace was his love for music, and he played the violin whenever he could. Unfortunately, one day while he was supposed to be working, he was playing his violin when older brother Isaac caught him. Well, Joe took an awful beating for that one. And Isaac told him, he said, I'm gonna smash that instrument to pieces if I ever catch you again playing when you're supposed to be working. Well, that did it. Enough was enough and it was time to go. The boy already held a deep-rooted hate for his brother and Isaac's nasty, short-tempered disposition was rubbing off on Joe. So now we have two guys, three guys with nasty dispositions. That night, the 15-year-old Joe took his beloved fiddle and ran off and headed to El Paso, Texas. Once in El Paso, now Joe could fiddle in the saloons to keep his belly full. 
and a roof over his head. And however successful that may have become, Joe sent a letter to a Mrs. Granville Ory. Her name was Sarah Melvina Ory, actually. And he was asking for some travel money. Turns out she was an old friend of the family from back in Missouri, and she just now lived in Florence over in Arizona Territory. When the reply arrived from Mrs. Ory, she invited Joe to become her ward. Joe hightailed it over to Florence as quick as he could, and the gracious lady not only gave him an education, but she also helped him to start up a freight business. Now that was a pretty good thing. And it's interesting that Joe Fry was actually married to one of the Cavanish girls. But that's another long story, and I know you've probably seen that one already. That's up on, the, up on our stories already. But I have to interject here and tell you who Mrs. Rory's husband actually was. He was quite a prestigious individual. He was uh, the man who practiced law, presided as judge at district court for Arizona and New Mexico, and he was elected a delegate for Arizona to the Confederate Congress. In 1862, he served as a captain in Herbert's Battalion, Arizona Cavalry, and he became a Confederate Army and Army Colonel on the staff for General Sibley. Well, now that we know who Mr. Ory was, we can get on with what uh, Joseph Fy was doing. He was driving freight over the rough roads from Florence to Prescott and Skull Valley and soon made a name for himself. He was, he was known as a dependable businessman and a solid citizen in the community. His brother had done one thing right when he installed some backbone in this boy. Now a man, Joe had become a man who didn't back down from a challenge no matter what it might be. He too had some hard bark about him. One case in point, a story comes to mind here, is that uh, once while driving through Skull Valley en route to Prescott with a load of freight, Joe ran into an Indian ambush on Woolsey's Hill. Joe and his shotgun guard, a man by the name of McNulty, were pitted against a superior number of savages. This was not a good thing. The Indians informed Fi that they would spare the two of the white men's lives if they would turn over all the freight and the supplies. And while they hardly, while they were talking back and forth though, Joe sneakily, isn't that a great word, sneakily, unhitched one of the lead horses. He told McNulty to ride like hell to Skull Valley for hell. McNulty did just as he was told and galloped out of the range of the Redskins. The infuriated hostiles turned their attention to Fye. With only his six gun and a rifle, he stood off more than a dozen Redskins for three hours until McNulty returned with help. They then finally ran the Redskins off. This Joe Fi had some of that hard bark we talked about earlier. But unlike Sheriff Pete, supposedly Joe neither drank or smoked. He just got mad a lot. Well, now that we see a little bit about their backgrounds and political differences, we can look at some of the other extenuating circumstances that caused serious contention between the two men. Now we get back to that election in 1884. Pete Gabriel has won the sheriff's badge and has appointed Joe Fye to be his deputy. Unfortunately, Fye's bad attitude and quick temper got him into hot water with his boss. Pete was forced to arrest his deputy, once for disorderly conduct, and again when he pistol whipped a man in the street for saying something that he didn't like at all about Pete. Fye was mad. In the heat of the moment, Joe also blindly took a swing at a woman who was trying to make Fye stop beating the man. Pete had no choice but to fire his own deputy. Well, Gabriel did leave office as he planned at the end of his term in 1886. And he retired to Dripping Springs Mountains, only occasionally venturing to town for supplies to conduct business. Over the next two years, 
Peter Gabriel and Joe Fye only added more fuel to the increasing bad blood between them. Gabriel also seemed to be mean as a snake, while Joe allowed his hatred to fester over having been arrested and publicly humiliated by Gabriel. So this blood feud just kept building and building. Even so, the pot hadn't boiled over, but by golly, it was close. Well, now that we have all the players in place, we can get down to the notorious gunfight itself. Of course, here are several different versions of how the shooting unfolded. And as is usually the case, most versions differ greatly one to the other. They fall into the category of eyewitness report syndrome, which means that no two people see the same thing. Rarely are two testimonies ever exactly the same. It is the morning of May 31st, 1888, and Pete Gabriel is making one of his periodic pilgrimages to Florence down from the Riverside area. He is traveling with his friend Mike Rice, who later recalled that by the time they reached their destination, Gabriel was all in. From consuming the liquid libation, they generally accompanied them on such trips. Upon his arrival, Gabriel was warned that Joe Fye is all bowed up and looking for a fight. Gabriel apparently paid little attention to the threat and made his way over to John Keating's tunnel saloon for more drinks. From most witness accounts, it seems as though Gabriel was not really looking for a confrontation at all, but knowing what we know about the man, uh, we know that he would probably be more than willing to accommodate whatever the situation might offer up. Now, it's interesting to understand that Tunnel Saloon is a little different than most saloons that we talk about or that we've seen on TV or the movies or whatever. The Tunnel Saloon, in the upstairs, when you walked in the front door, you were in a saloon just like any other. But off to one side, you went down almost underground and this is where people would play cards and drink because it was cool down there. It was like 10, 15 degrees cooler down there in the tunnel than it was up at the regular bar. So knowing that, we're talking about the gunfight not taking place in the tunnel, but in the saloon itself. Now, just as it is in most small towns, news gets around fast. Sidney Burleson, a friend of Five's goes to the boarding house to warn Five that Gabriel is in town. And that is what prompted Five to grab up his gun belt and buoy knife, and off he headed to Keating's saloon. Once Five got to the saloon, he peeked in through the front window. Gabriel spotted him and reached for his gun, but Five disappeared too quickly. Patrons continued in and out all afternoon, and Pete moved his hand close to his six-suiter every time somebody walked through that door. He was going to be ready, just in case. However, it wasn't until 8 p.m. when finally Fi came back. Fi came busting through the front door with his pistol drawn and buoy knife in hand. Pete yelled out, Joe, and both men began firing. One account maintains that an errant bullet extinguished the only light in the room. Then 11 shots were fired between the two men. Gabriel followed on down the bar toward Phi, but Phi lunged forward and fired directly point blank into Gabriel's chest. The bullet tore into Gabriel's one good lung and the next slug pierced his intestines. But incredibly, Gabriel managed to stay to his feet and he didn't go down. He just wouldn't go down and forced forced Fi to be backing up as they were firing, and both men just kept shooting and shooting and shooting. Then one of Gabriel's bullets hit Fi in the left thigh and shattered the bone while another slammed into his belly. Fi buckled over in pain as he fell through the door onto the sidewalk. Gabriel moved in and fired the last round at point-blank range. That bullet crashed into Fi's right shoulder and down through both lungs. Joe let out a gasp and he said, oh my God, I'm down. For all intents and purposes, Fi should have known at this point that he was done for. 
But he still had that bowie knife, and with one last defiant act, he lashed out at Gabriel as he declared, you murdering son of a bitch. And then he was out of it. Quickly as it had started, it was over. And afterwards, John Keating stood in the doorway at the tunnel saloon, gazing out at the chaotic aftermath. Some of the bystanders carried fire to the stage company corral where the doctor remarkably was able to remove one of the bullets, but he couldn't do him much good after that. It was by 1230 midnight that Joe finally gave in and he died of internal bleeding. Now friends in town carried Pete Gabriel to an adobe house next to the Pinal County Sheriff's Office. Gabriel angrily sent the doctor away because the doctor was actually his doctor and he went to five first. So Gabriel didn't want any parts of him, he made him go away. So now they had to find another sheriff. And they sent word to Thomas Sabin and uh, he was up in Sacatan. So it took a while for him to even get there. In fact, after traveling four and a half hours, Doc Sabin finally reached Pete's bedside. And he told the ex-sheriff the same kind of news that Pete had heard one time before over in LA. You are shot through the intestines and right lung. Your condition is hopeless. Peter shrugged this off as he had the first time over in LA. Who would have thought? Tough old bird that he was and true to his word, Peter Gabriel was back on his feet within a month. I'm sure he wasn't doing any 10 Ks at the time, but he was back on his feet. And six months after that, he was back in the saddle as a deputy sheriff hunting the enigmatic Ham White, who was a desperate, desperate stage robber. And a year after that, he was actually a member of the posse who was chasing after the famous Apache Kid. He, of course, the Apache Kid was uh, partly, if not mostly, responsible for the killings during what happened to be known as the Kelvin Grade Massacre. You can go see that one, too, on the story about the Apache Kid. Well, sir, Peter Gabriel was finally able to retire from the law dog business and return to his mining interests at Mi Monitor Mine. The Monitor was actually his mine, and that was at the head of the Mineral Creek Mining District up in Dripping Springs Mountain. Ironically, despite all of what he'd been through, on July 29th, 1898, some friends discovered the old sheriff dying at his camp. The general belief was that he'd been drinking some poisonous water. I mean, there was lots of cyanide and water up there, and they said that that's probably what had killed him. However, not everybody bought into that story. And one of those people was Michael Rice, his old friend who contended that Pete was just too much of a miner and a desert man to make so stupid a mistake. Those friends who found Gabriel buried the body right where they found him. It was never even marked as a grave until 1936 when another group came up from Florence. They got together and they erected a headstone that recognized his accomplishments as a sheriff. Well, there you have it. Personally, I wonder what more there is to this story. What caused these two old friends to reach a point of wanting to absolutely destroy each other? Not just get in a gunfight, but destroy each other. We know Joe Fi wound up dead, shot to pieces by Peter Gabriel. And strange as it may sound, according to Michael Rice, Peter Gabriel was actually haunted by the event up until the date of his death. It just drove him crazy. He used to get up in the saloons and just start shooting at the ceiling with his gun until the gun was empty. And he'd call out Joe's name. What we can say without reservation is that Peter Gabriel and Joe Fi did fight one of the last face-to-face -face gunfights to ever take place in Arizona uh, territory. And we can also say that it is one of the most notoriously brutal gunfights to ever take place in the Arizona Territory. But then when everything is taken into account in the final analysis, did anybody really win at that gunfight 
over 130 years ago at the Tunnel Saloon. I wonder. I think I hear the devil laughing somewhere. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.